Thank you, boss. Thank you, Barbara, for making us all welcome. Thank you, Megan and Adam and the staff. Thank you, Sydney, our wonderful co-teacher in our wonderful workshop. And to old friends, this is a poem I wrote for Claudia and Kent. <clears throat> an orchard at the bottom of a hill. Why don't you try just being quiet? If you can find some silence, maybe you can listen to it. How it works is interesting. I really can't explain it, but you know it when it's happening. You realize you're marveling at apple blossoms and how they're clustered on the tree and you see the bees meticulously attending every blossom there. And you think the tree is kind of sighing. Such careful beauty in the making. And then you think, it's really quiet. But I am not alone in this world. That's how you know it's happening. There's something solemn and wonderful in the quiet, a slow and steady ease whether the tree is actually sighing is beside the point. It's better to wonder. You needn't be precise with quiet. It just becomes another thing. It isn't a science. It's an art, like love, or a dog who's pretty good, asleep in the grass beneath the tree. Sorry, just before this all started, I was having a coughing fit. <clears throat> Froggy. Hummingbird hearts. Somewhere in history, some king, out of vanity that was total, probably had prepared for him a pie of hummingbird hearts, which would have required a servant to catch the birds in a net, another servant was directed to make and therefore made. Making the lonely net would surely have been a tedious affair. And the system that quietly followed of singular authority and the varied caste of servants below the preening, unattractive king, fat in the haunch and sorely disliked, yet roundly and silently obeyed, required its own dark tedium. A bureaucracy is born, a way of being in the world composed of appetite and simple whim. We wildly want, then reach. You have to do what you have to do to preserve yourself, which then preserves the king. But all of this misses the bird a fierce creature hovering often in our presence before a plainly appointed purple flower to bring beauty to other beauty a king cannot appreciate. I've made my stance among flowers and seen what birds will do. They visit and they bring love into the world and a glory I am bound to claim. The claim of kings to holiness is empty, and the hum, presiding, constant, is the proof. Pinhead. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. And now the little wheel is turning, as if encouraged by a stream and the stream of thought that's always there rather serenely most of the time. Yesterday, a flock of ducks was on it, a flutter in the distance and then another flutter, dividing light to tiny pieces just above the visionary steady stream. The thought at the moment is to connect a man I used to know who was called a pinhead by some with the famous quote about the angels dancing in joy upon the head of a pin. 
I see them in a circle, their angels from the country in my mind turning. The image of the man returns to me surprisingly often. I see that little head on his shoulders. You couldn't look away from him or keep yourself from wondering what he thinks about that thing up there. He had to know something was not quite right. On the other hand, his options for change had obvious limits. A hat, a very large hat, is all I've ever been able to come up with. It's awkward even now to think about it. He used to strut around like a banny rooster. People used to talk like that. I liked it too. The art of understatement was in the air. A bantam rooster is the littlest rooster I've ever been around. Not much reason to strut, but reason and roosters are rarely joined by ordinary thought. <clears throat> reason just slips away when it comes to roosters. <laughs> Slicker than a minner's, Peter. <laughs> yep, heard that one a time or two. Makes you wonder how such discoveries are made. <clears throat> Lots of slickness out there. The pinhead situation was strange. One of those things, a fact of life. Not that the man had much of a life. Not a lot of contemplation. I didn't know him very well, if you want to know the truth. And yet, it's wonderful how one thing sets another thing in motion. The stream is turning that eternal wheel, proverbial cornbread time. Meanwhile, the angels are dancing around in their little circle of joy. I believe they're up there, but I see the distance is returning. Strange to put it that way, but there it is, my oldest friend. The Gospel of Music. I believe I've read this here before. Most of these are new since last summer. <clears throat> Gospel of Music. You have to thank the great beyond if your child delights in birdsong, especially a chorus of it, a dizzy crowd of birds singing, warbles, chits, and caws ringing through the sanctuary of the woods. Although I heard the birds myself, it was the little one who pointed her finger to the budding trees and pronounced the word she has for music, composed of a pair of syllables, both beginning vaguely with Y, with emphasis rightly on the first. It happens also to be the word she has for donkey, <laughs> and the plural of donkey. And it's also the word she says regarding the photograph of an old time banjo player she sees at supper time. She sees the sound of a silent instrument and that's the true gospel of music. In the beginning was the word and the word was music and birds and donkeys and God was a serious banjo player with an inscrutable face who said to everything alive, I made the world for singing now you sing. <clears throat> Three old mountain women. They were country beauties in their time, but I knew them when they were old, wearing straight dark dresses below the knee, absolved of passion, what little there had been because the women I'm thinking of, my kin, were practical, mothers of children, the rearing, the little patch of land, and their continuance, what they were born to, a hard place, a people. Above all, they were gardeners, green down to their being roots, and roots in the spreading ground below their calm countenance, when sitting in a straight-backed chair, a voice prompted them to tell a tale, and then they told it plainly 
aware I sometimes thought of what effect hearing the tale would have on me, but now I think I merely needed a voice, a voice suspended in the air. Well, I declare, and together they gave it to me. Several of the poems I'm going to read are um, look like this on the page. They're a kind of double sonnet with a truncated line and irregular rhyme. So really not. It's just, <laughs> it's just 28 lines. <clears throat> Memories of an omnipotent God. I recollect when God would stab a lightning bolt in the ground beside a man who'd wandered into the realm of wrong, and the man would come to his senses and change and spend the rest of his days reciting the incident and how it made him the thankfulest man on earth. It was a sign old God was watching, and a further sign the man upstairs was pretty good with a lightning bolt right in the ground beside the sinner who came away with only a smudge on his face and a wonderful song in his heart. That would be something to sing about, the relief from grief. The realm of wrong. Now there's a curious way to say it. It's allegorical and real at once and cannot be divided, but division is a powerful art, a part to set apart from the whole and leave it wandering and lonely. The days of lightning bolts are gone, I'd say. Old God has moved along. He might be out of lightning bolts. The days of common sinners are gone as well. The realm of wrong is now another realm. There's nothing else to do but take the banjo down and play the devil out of it. I'm thinking of a mournful tune and the sound of bugs below the moon and the human quiet coming soon after the singing of the tune. I'm sorry, this is sounding pretty dire and uh, <laughs> sleepy. Bobby Ann said, please do something to keep me awake. Some of you know that uh, an old nickname for either North Carolina or South Carolina is Kakalaki. Yeah. <laughs> this is called a Kakalaki yard bird reconsidered. <laughs> Roosters are, uh, apparently are a theme, uh, <laughs> a motif. <laughs> Kakalaki yard bird reconsidered. An old ancestor of mine ventured to one of the Carolinas once in order to retrieve a rooster. It was a journey there and back, uphill in both directions, the kind of going forth that leads to a tail, requiring embellishment, a grim appraisal of the human condition, and a pretty little barefoot gal who almost swayed the author from his task to bring the rooster home. There was even a witch in there somewhere. But the author liked to tell the tale a different way each time as if he knew a story has to change. He called his rooster Lion Tom because the author had observed a rooster can't abide the truth. Now the man I've called the author was indeed the author of the tale, but he was in the tale, you see, and so the author of his fate. He had a scheme that reached beyond the tale to travel far to find a yard bird from the furnace place a feller ever could imagine, and thus the chance to make a boast, common in those distant days, but sure to bring the company of strangers curious to see the fine fangled preening bird. The story sprouted like a seed, and Lion Tom became a legend, and the author got to tell the tale. That was the reason I realize now with the foggy wisp of time twitching like a spider silk behind the tail for fetching the bird at all. 
the loneliness a man could feel, even at home, even when love is all around. This same old-timer liked to gamble, I'm told, on the top of a coffin lid. Making coffins was his trade, and passing out in one was not uncommon, given that the cards went hand in hand with imbibery, and yet he aimed to be redeemed eventually. The Lord would swoop from out of nowhere like a hawk or flutter gentle as a dove to bring the broken human soul together again and make it sing. His tale was always about redemption, but no one ever sees it coming, not even the author of the tale. Reckon I'm on my way, he said one night in the dead heat of summer. I just don't know it yet. He smiled and spread his cards out in the dark, symbolically on the coffin lid, about the time old lion Tom crowed in the day on the early side, when stars were still high in the sky and the hillsides were holding time like a ladle full of old soup. But lion Tom was a useful bird. He filled the air with invention. And when you live in such a sleepy place, Invention is what you have to do. It gives you something to talk about if any strangers happen by and loneliness is in their eyes. Scarecrow. In my grandmother's garden once, she let me make the scarecrow. But the one I wanted to make was too involved too lifelike, and so he got reduced to a pair of sticks fastened together, I recall, by half of a boot lace into a T. I stabbed him into the stony ground. He was about my size, but that was all we had in common. He stared into his patch of the world. The scarecrow was ahead of me in solitude. When I wondered why he didn't have shoes, she said, a scarecrow don't have feet, honey. Elsewise, he'd run away because he'd be scared of himself. <laughs> Except, she said, he'd be a scared. And apparently, adding another note to the word made me remember it. And by the time I finished, the scarecrow I thought was a man was wearing a dress mysteriously and looked like her returning from a funeral, a symbol, something that mattered once, something I loved and blindly loved. <clears throat> My left side. My left side is kinked and painful in the neck and shoulder, in the hip, and that's the side for most of what I do in hammering or raising above the left foot a shovel to move the gritty dirt from high up into ground and level it. Or to begin with stacking rocks, I start on the left to make a wall or move a wall already there. Or shoring the barn, I begin on the left, uphill. And when I sing in praise, or from an anguish I can't let fly like a ragged crow over the hill, I turn my head slightly to the left because it helps me hear the song and when to put the hiccup in the voice and let it lope along like a tramp. And sometimes I just look to the left to see if something's there, if the figure entering the woods halfway through the heartsick chorus with his left hand raised is me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Still life with little pitcher. The knot hole looks like a pitcher spout, about 10 feet up the tree, bearded with moss, its own creation, though part of the tree. 
and a spray of violets is pouring out of it like a spring, but paused as if a hand inside the tree decided only to tip the pitcher and show the leaves and flowers reaching over the lip of the spout and the vine behind the opening as if the vine has climbed around the handle to peer inside the spout. But the handle is gone inside the tree forever and never will come out. This is called the latch, L-A-T-C-H, like a latch on a gate. Makes a nice little sound when you close the gate. Clicks into place. <clears throat> the latch. One sound, the click of the latch on the gate, is like the clap or the slider slap of a hand against the thigh to declare someone who needs to clear his head is leaving. The smitten wren chatters as I walk through rain into the woods, the hillside choir loft, where soon I see in silhouette another bird bobbing like a cork on the upper branch of a tree in perfect rhythm with the rain. Shouldn't I, in the gaze of silver droplets clinging to black branches, follow the sky and lay my burden down on the ground below these open rafters? Again, I've gone to hear the song of mercy, and here it is, the resound of higher voices, note by note, and I look up to see the score of the sky is plainly open, and I, a wanderer, have entered the song and must be singing too. <clears throat> um, this is called sugar. When um, used to be someone uh, was diabetic, and people said they had sugar. Sugar. The boy had sugar, so every morning he gave himself a shot in the top of his thigh. I never watched him do it, however. There was a fascination, and once he let me touch the knot of flesh that rose up without any wonder for him. He stuck himself in the morning and that was that. He also went to a slow school. This is how he talked about himself. He had sugar and he went to a school for slow children. And these were the facts. His father beat the hell out of him for no good reason. But the boy expected the beatings and learned to mark them like notches on the stick of life. The father used to joke he'd wear the belt in two on the hide of his son. Don't make me tan your hide, he'd say. And the son would cower and cry and shudder, and that would satisfy the father. I've wondered about the realities of life, especially the things that might be done in the name of love the unforgivable acts of love. One summer, my friend and I were playing in the yard catching fireflies. We called them lightning bugs and let them light a finger held up against the stars or pointed to the darkness beyond the trees at the back of the long yard. A fire demon, a little devil composed of fire with a fiery face and black holes for eyes and a mouth, sprang out of a bush and ran beside us along the ground and down the yard before it returned to the spirit world. I say the spirit world because I've not seen anything like it since. I've heard some haunted voices, but I only saw the demon once. We gave it a name, the two of us. We decided to call it a fire demon because the world was literal, and that's how we were living in it. 
a little blaze we saw just once. He had a dog named Sugar, too. She was just a big old country dog who slept on the porch and never barked. But she barked at the fire demon that night, proof we had seen what we had seen running blindly into the dark. And Sugar always backed away whenever the father raised his voice to lean against the boy's leg exactly where he stuck himself. She was just a big old country dog. If there's a resurrection for dogs, she's one of a few I'd recommend. The father lived with a misery as old as the world, and I, <clears throat> and I think it broke him. And the belt was just an illusion he held and a sign of his own suffering. And only in the allegory that grows in the long garden of time can I see the belt for what it was, and the two boys, and the dog, and the demon. You have to bring love into the world, love into the nameless world. This one's a little tongue twistery. <clears throat> Eaves dropping, early morning, everything alive. When dew drips down from leaves to land on other lower leaves and shines them to reflect the sun with such precision that the reflection presents the brighter light, I conclude when going into the world to see what morning has brought to it one may be looking simply for something to praise without expecting to halt in the gaze, soon so clearly going both ways, and that will shine all of the day and riddle anything to say, even when sleep and darkness call. And so when praising, praise it all. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> this is another fake double sonnet. <laughs> <clears throat> Called the Knot, K N O T. <clears throat> I have a complicated knot I won't untie that lives on a loop of string with another loop twisted or wandered through it as if the loops belong to each other, but it's not easy to see how they are joined. My father tied the knot long back, some year when I didn't know him, when I didn't think he knew himself or me, or would imagine now the moment of my study, not untying anything about the knot he tied that now outlives him and sits there living on the string. The double loop, the knot, the string, he tied with purpose and made this thing, designed, I think, for doubling. What else to do but study it, to see the silent hitch and sing? Old man, I see your hand in mine, and in it something rare and fine. I like a hitch in the line like you. My little art is doubling too. And you were just a lonely man with a string and a pair of sleepy hands who made a knot with two loops through it to remind me without saying so you longed for love and tied me to it. This is a hilarious poem. <laughs> and my, my wife ran over to Atlanta, so she's not going to get embarrassed. 
After all these years, my woman's done got voluptuous. <laughs> Life changes. Things come and go. And things that never were before delightfully appear. <laughs> One thing that pleases me, delectatio profundo, to give it <laughs> classical freight, is what I'll nicely call increase. A rich bounty now lies abed, and I have feasted on the spread. Previously, there was a wiggle, modest, comely. Yet add to that in time's sweet passage, lo, a jiggle. And the situation suggests a panting painting where, ah, the birds do sing, and the beloved's less a little thing. The well. The old voices I used to hear, especially when I was not addressed, but overhearing or only a listener, in a way still speak to me, which tells me years of listening was better than going to school. I wasted a lot of time in school and learned surprisingly little. I remember sitting in the basement of the hardware store where I worked, covered in coal dust, and an older man said, well, in two long syllables with a little pause before he hoisted his body up to get back at it, and another man said right on the beat, it's a deep subject, which <laughs> prompted the first to add, for such a shallow mind, these two men sort of danced with each other in that gloomy place. I was stacking shovels on a rack, wiping off the dust with a rag in the basement of a hardware store. A lot was going on down there. Two men with little education were sharing a line of poetry, and I was just a teenage boy over my head, but learning how to listen to the art of the air instructed by a couple of birds whose names I don't remember now. I'll skip that one. <clears throat> you all know a, what a big galvanized wash tub looks like? The, the big one's in number 10, that's the size. Useful for many things. This is called, I've Got Those Mean Old Number 10 Wash Tub Blues. <laughs> Everything is a metaphor. Even the bent over heads of grass that's gone to seed and the sway they make and the rhythm of the swaying, devoted little emblems of green. Sometimes I turn the wash tub over when I think a rain is coming in to let the rain thump the bottom of the tub, a nice, low, sleepy sound depending on the rain. I enjoy that kind of truth. The daydream wanders into the light. More often, however, the wash tub only hangs by its handle from a nail in the barn and the tub is mute except when it catches from the distance the old man farther down the way calling his cows home for the night with a high-pitched whoo and whoop and the open tub cradles his voice and lulls it lightly back as if a hymn is being sounded out. It isn't despair I hear in his voice, but I like to hear the lonely in it and how the wash tub makes it ring. An old man's voice in a wash tub, a daydream making its way to the light, very particular instruments. We might as well add a spice bush to the scene and work it into the low refrain, the thumping low refrain, depending on the rain.
Three more. <clears throat> Y'all know the uh, English romantic painter J.M.W. Turner, that guy? Yeah. I figured you would know him, Noah. <laughs> <laughs> what a silly question. <clears throat> This is called Like Living in a Turner Painting. One morning when the weather was strange and haunted following a rain, I believe a fog had settled like a thought over the field and the sun that peered through it troubled the thought. I remember saying to myself, for no one was around, it's like we're living in a Turner painting, a haunted cave of melody so indistinct, almost unseen as if a painting could convey its time and also imagine a time after, but keep the original time to let it heavily hang in the present. The point is, something in the world is timeless, beyond the measure of time, yet we perceive the timeless in time, aware of its weight and of its passing lightly like a song through a voice. It isn't always beautiful, the voice, the time, the foggy scene. I said the fog had settled like a thought over the field, but the thought was mine. I wasn't sure if the scene was beautiful. Something was ghostly. The spirit of something not alive was there. But maybe it was alive, a spirit passing through the night, now lingering over the field. The sun as cold as a cat-eye marble, was out of place in the scene, but there. We love the sweeter passages of time, but never get it right. The sense of time floating in time, the effort to capture time in time, in verse, in the ancient rhythm of verse, not in my voice, but a timeless voice haunted by a timeless voice before it, rhythmic, keeping time to the world of trees and fields and fog resounding as if a fog resounds. That is the effort of my art, such as it is. It's a plain thing, as plain as a field in early spring with two or three blurry symbols composed almost completely of silence because it's there, the oldest art and that's what Turner painted, silence. A little red book, red as in the color. A little red book. All is danger in this growth of being alone and not alone on the wet redeeming path in the woods and the wordless study of solitude that follows the path invisibly. Whatever is in the mind rattles, but then it too becomes absorbed after a few unsteady steps and stops listening to itself. So I listen to the world and see it, but that is the world. Today, the world is raining. I'm not raining myself, though the sound of fingers thrumming a table in the sky is pleasing to my ear. Today, the world is rainy and grayish with patches of white. It isn't yet what it's going to be. The world is always becoming something else. It won't be still, and yet it has the feeling of being constant, especially if from a distance you see some hills for days and days they seem the same, remote and rounded and blurrier the farther you see, and thus more likely to seem unchanging. Art, I think, must offer more than mere appearance. The world is more than mere appearance. It's vastly more. Try listening to rain and see what you think. It's like having a little red book whose spine is cracked, and you crack it open one more time, and there before you is something else to think about. 
If it has symbolic meaning, it's still too soon to tell, but you study it as if the sun is coming out or a long empty pond is filled and a butterfly that should have been battered to nothing is rising from the grass. Last one. <clears throat> Two shadows. The little one belongs to her, and the taller one is mine, though I doubt she knows the shadows walking hand in hand ahead of us in the field are ours. If I walk behind her, mine, without a word, overshadows all of hers, a magic I think she likes. And when I walk at her side again, the two of us return, a giant and his long-legged little helper, who's new enough to walking still, she manages a wobble or swings a foot in picking the place to put it. None of this beautiful secret love will last. Other shadows will come along, and she'll see her own one day, apart from mine. But before those fates arrive, I'm going to stretch my arms, and tipping and twirling, I'll show her how to turn her shadow into a bird and rest it softly in the tree. And afterward, when she sees a shadow, perhaps she'll think of birds or me. Thank you.